I was a defense attorney for six years before I joined the Davis County Attorney's Office in January of 2000. So I've been on both sides of the spectrum on this issue. I both defended people who have been charged with criminal activity uh, related to sex offenses and pornography, particularly child pornography, and then prosecuted for six years, almost seven, from 2001 through 2007. That was my sole assignment in the Davis County Attorney's Office until I became the elected was prosecuting all of the sex offense cases that occurred in our jurisdiction that we had enough evidence to prosecute. So I become acquainted with the issue and the law, and, and I will just give you guys the disclaimer right up front. This is frustrating. I, I think at the end of my presentation here today, hopefully there will be some rays of hope I will give you. I'm gonna give you some examples of some good and positive things that have been done, and hopefully a game plan and some things that maybe you can do, but when you talk about this issue and the topic I'm addressing today, when you're talking about the law, the criminal justice system, and you're talking about pornography, obscenity, child sex offenses and child pornography issues running up against uh, the constitutional protections of the First Amendment uh, and free speech and artistic speech, commercial free speech, the conundrum is, is sometimes difficult to negotiate and all, uh, I guess quite frankly frustrating. So I think today you're gonna to get the sense from me a little bit of that and maybe understand why prosecutors in your jurisdiction have a little bit of a difficult time being as aggressive as some of you probably would like. So this is not a presentation today where you're gonna be walking out of here thinking, okay, the criminal justice system is the answer to solving society's pornography issues. Uh, actually, I'm here today to tell you that in large part, the criminal justice system is not, except when it comes to child pornography, we have much better chances of success there. So let me begin a little bit on the journey as I get to the laws. And in trying to figure out how to do this today, there's a lot of ways I could have attacked this topic. One of the ways would have just been simply to go through all the Utah laws with you. I have them at the end of my presentation. Uh, I vastly underestimated the number of folks that would be here today, so I'm happy to email this presentation to any of you who want it. Um, I'll give you my email address right now because the presentation at the end, it has the links to a lot of to the Utah statutes that are on point, Utah statutory law, and so electronically you'll get that from me. My email address is troy at daviscountyutah.gov. Davis County, Utah, all one word, all spelled out, all small, so D A V I S C O U N T Y U T A H dot gov. Troy at daviscountyutah.gov. Any of you who want this presentation, I'll email it to you. I have a whole bunch of supplemental documents too that we won't have time to get to today that I can also send as attachments to give you more of the background I'm going to talk about. But I guess to kind of help shape for you a little bit my perspective on this issue, it, it goes back to when I was 19 years old and I, first, and I saw firsthand in a situation that I walked into in an apartment complex in Washington, D.C., the impact that pornography can have on human life. The devastating negative impact pornography can have on human life. I happened to have an occasion to be in an apartment complex one day in Washington, D.C. in 1985, it would have been, uh, and, and came, across, came, came across a woman who the door was open to her apartment and there was a woman inside of an apartment, I could see inside, and she was curled up in a fetal position, and she was rocking back and forth in that fetal position. On a blanket, besides this woman, were two infants. It turned out that those infants were twins, eventually, but two infants laying down with bloated stomachs, laying down on their backs, crying, and by those two infants, I kid you not, the strangest concoction you could imagine, it was a cup with a syringe in it, and that syringe had water, nail polish, and hair, was what was in that cup. And this woman had been putting it in these infants' mouths for who knows how long. She is laying there, and by her, what was spread out all over in the room? Pornographic magazines, materials. So this is 1985, back in the days, we have internet issues now that are more prevalent, but pornographic, your, you know, your, your, your garden variety porn, which we'll talk about today, and I don't use that term to excuse it, but legally there are some distinctions between pornography and obscenity that I hope you walk out of here today understanding. Uh, we're talking Playboy, Penthouse, those type of magazines were on the floor surrounding this woman. In communication with her, myself and the other gentleman that I was with and trying to figure out what was going on, we actually went into this apartment seeing what was going on. She was moaning wailing. She had on a visor of all things. It was a green visor, baseball cap type visor, plastic visor, 
rocking back and forth, and eventually what we could get out of her while in the process of calling the, the police, which we did, but eventually what we got out of her was she was upset. She was beat. We noticed that physically. This woman had been beaten. She had bruises and marks on her face. She had swelling. And what we got out of her was that her husband had beat her. He was in the military. He was stationed at a nearby base. He was at work that day. But he had beaten her because she didn't look like the women in those magazines. That's what we got out of that woman. That's what I saw as a 19-year-old. And that's what began to shape my perspective in real life, in real time, that there are issues here uh, that impact human life significantly. We actually ended up calling the police. She gave us the phone number. We called her husband at work. Uh, a commanding officer answered. They tracked down the husband. We told him it was an emergency situation. Uh, I told the husband on the phone what was going on. Here's the scene at your home, and we've called the police. He was very angry at me. And of course, we were gone before he got home, but the police did arrive. They took a statement from us. I never had to testify. I never heard any more about it, so I can't tell you what happened with that situation and that man in that home, but I can tell you what I saw and observed. A battered, bruised woman abusing children in a very emotional, mental state where she was not really coherent. And what was she upset about? That her husband was upset with her that she didn't look like the women in those magazines. We have a problem in our society. In a situation like that, the criminal justice can intervene. And I don't know what happened with that case, but there are sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. The issues that we deal with, to set the stage for you as I kind of take you on a brief tour of some of the legal issues presented to prosecutors in society at large, I mean, you're bombarded all around you every day, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. You take a drive in your car on the interstate, you go into a grocery store, you watch TV, the advertisements, even of a sporting event. One of the ones that was the most highly offensive to me, as far as advertisements go, and I'm gonna tell you this before I get to some of the legal issues to kind of explain to you why what we can and can't do with the criminal justice system. But any of you remember a DirecTV ad a few years ago, and it infuriated me. I actually called DirecTV about it myself because I was upset about the ad. But what the ad was is it was too apparently looking, the, the boys in the, in the advertisement looked to me to be 14, 15-ish, 16 maybe at the most. These boys are at home, they're watching TV, and an advertisement comes on with a model who's scantily clad, seductive type woman, talking in the advertisement about HDTV. That if you subscribe to HDTV, get direct TV in high definition, you'll be able to get, and her quote was, the sexiest show ever. And the young men that were in that advertisement that DirecTV had that were like, oh, scrambling to try to figure out how do they subscribe to HDTV clearly appeared to me to be underage. And that what was, was offensive to me about that ad. Now, there was nothing in the ad with the way the woman was dressed that's prosecutable or criminal when you look at the definitions under the law. But it was highly offensive. And that's what you're dealing with in our society today. Make no mistake about it, the pornography industry, they understand the law. They have very good attorneys who know the law. And I'm going to talk to you about an encounter I had with one of them a few years ago, led to Spencer's Gifts, here in a little bit. But they know the envelopes that they can push. They know the lines. And they know the problems that prosecutors can sometimes face in dealing with these issues. And they push those. And part of what they want to do is get people hooked in these type of materials at a, at a young age. So that ad particularly offended me, but that's what we're dealing with in society. Candy shop. Um, I don't know if any of you ever remember this. This is a video. In 2007, I was invited by then U.S. Attorney Brett Tolman to be one of the designees from the state of Utah. Each U.S. attorney got to invite one county attorney back to St. Louis to a, a seminar. It was called Project Safe Neighborhood. In that seminar, I first became acquainted with an issue that I've been able to spend a lot more time dealing with a woman here today. And Jennifer, if you can stand up for just a second, I want to introduce everybody to you. Dr. Jennifer Brown out of Bountiful. I'm going to be talking a little bit about Jennifer's work today. Um, in addition to Janelyn Holt and others. But my first exposure to this issue was, here's what happened. I go to that seminar in Washington, in, excuse me, in St. Louis with, with, the, with Brett Tolman. One of the primary speakers at that seminar, she was a female professor from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We sit down and she gets up to make her presentation. The first thing she did before she even said a word to us, she walks up and she hits the play button on her computer and she pulls up and on, the, on comes her screen in that big ballroom at the hotel in St. Louis, a video that was a popular video on MTV. The video was called Candy Store. I don't recommend any of you watch that video unless you feel a need to educate yourselves, but definitely not your kids. 
sitting there in that room with 50 county attorneys from around the country and all the U.S. attorneys from around the country, it was very uncomfortable still to watch that video in the presence of adults. What that video was about, it was a rap video, and that video was very, very sexually oriented, uh, women wearing almost a next to nothing. And what it was about, it was about the rapper singing the song, going into what's called the candy store. It was a brothel. And the candy was the women, and he was going to be able to pick out which one he was going to purchase then and consume. That's what that video was about. It made me uncomfortable watching that video, sitting in there. So when she got done, the point then that she made to us, what her presentation was about, her presentation was about the impact of these type of images on the human brain on us physiologically, biologically. And so then she went through and she showed us the studies that she'd been doing at Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, about the impact of images on the human brain. And particularly, she started to get into adolescent brain development as well. I, I was stunned because you, obviously, in sitting there watching that video, it made the dramatic point, and you could understand what she was talking about, because both men and women, there probably wasn't anybody in that room watching that video that wasn't impacted in some way, chemically, biologically, with what was going on in the brain activity, with what was going on emotionally, the sensory input that was being loaded into us, and then she commented and walked through us and explained to us how and why, what was happening, what was going on with our brains, both men and women, as we watched those images. So those sort of things impacted me as I became county attorney, and that's in large part the work that Dr. Jennifer Brown and Bountiful has been doing over the last few years, and she has an excellent summary on adolescent brain development and the impact on it. And then if Senator Todd Weiler's here today, I'm going to give him a kudos too for some things we've been working on over the last few years. Uh, last point I want to make in preface before we quickly take you on a tour of legal issues, domestic violence cases and child abuse. It's very, it's very rare, um, and I don't want to overstate the case, it's very rare in our county when we prosecute domestic violence cases that at the end of the day, and sometimes on all these cases, if it's minor, if it's a class B misdemeanor, you don't get onto their computers and you don't get onto their cell phones because you don't need search warrants if it's just a minor case. But whenever we do delve into it and we have to get into it on felony cases, there's search warrants, there's issues related to phones, disabled phones. Sometimes you get into the phones because it's a disabled device. Anyway, almost inevitably, we find on domestic violence cases where there's physical and mental and emotional abuse, just what I saw in Washington, D.C. in 1985. We find the perpetrators usually have one, if not two, or all three of the following. Addictions to pornography drugs or alcohol. Those are very often, more often than not, in our domestic violence cases, those dynamics in a combination of any one or two or three are present. Drugs, alcohol, and very often consumption of pornography in our adult domestic violence perpetrators. It's very often an issue in their life. I know social scientific literature would debate me on that. I get it. I've read it. I know the social scientists that say there's no causation. You can't show it, Mr. Prosecutor. Okay, fine. I'm telling you, though, in Davis County, that's what we see when we prosecute these cases and we get evidence and material about what's going on on the computers and phones and in the lives of, of these perpetrators. I can pretty much say always on child sex offense cases, and I did a ton of them. At one point in time, a member of the Board of Pardons and Parole told me, just because nothing greater inherent about me, just because I did so many cases, in about 2007, the board told me that I had more people I'd prosecuted in prison on child sex offense cases than any other prosecutor currently at that time. So I saw a lot of these cases. That's the only reason I tell you that. Because I did them. I did a lot of them. Nothing great about me. It was my caseload. But why do I tell you that? Because I don't ever remember a case of a child physical ab touching case sexual abuse of a child, aggravated sexual abuse, rape of a child, sodomy on a child, object rape of a child, where child pornography was not a component of the perpetrator's life. So these issues are real, and they impact the criminal justice system. So let's talk about that then. Pornography, obscenity meets the criminal justice system. Now let me talk to you about my great frustrations about this quickly. I have received, over time, so many phone calls Welcome, Senator. So many phone calls uh, and emails from folks pleading and imploring me, Mr. Prosecutor of Davis County, you're the elected DA, do something. Some of the heart-wrenching emails that I've received, some of the uh, ones that literally j just you know, kind of bring you down, 
and, and wish you could wave a magic wand and solve the problems come from teenage girls in particular. Some of the most troubling emails I've received, I've received emails from mothers, from husbands, from people addicted to pornography, teenage boys, but I have to tell you, the phone calls and the emails I get when people go to the Victoria's Secrets in the, Dav in the Davis County, uh, in the Leighton Hills Mall in Davis County, uh, they see the Sports Illustrated swimsuit editions every year at Barnes & Noble or wherever, and thank goodness to a lot of you out there who have been worked on getting magazines covered, that helps. It truly does. It really has cut down on the number of complaints we get every year when those magazine racks are covered. So thank you very much. Um, the Victoria's Secret still oftentimes remains an issue though, but every year annually I get phone calls and complaints. I send out a letter to Barnes & Noble, Victoria's Secrets, you know, you name it. We have these ongoing dialogues asking them, please respect the wishes of the constituents of our community. Here's the Utah law, here's the statutes. Please make every effort to comply. But at the end of the day, their corporate attorneys know I'm gonna have a heck of a time ever trying to prosecute these entities for this. And I'm gonna explain to you why today. But what bugs me the most about the inability sometimes to aggressively address these issues as I would like is the emails from the teenage girls, the junior high school girls, sometimes the high school girls telling me how bad it makes them feel about themselves, their personal self-worth, their personal image when they go to that mall and they see their boyfriends they're with or the other guys they're with or their parents or their, their dads, their brothers, they see their reaction, they see them looking at these, even if it's jokingly, and then the young women see these images themselves and I get the emails and I have about 400 of them that I have saved. I have a folder where I save these emails from folks asking me, Mr. Prosecutor, please do something about this. Well, we have taken some steps to try to do what we can and I'm gonna to get to that for you today a little bit, but here's the underlying difficulty I want you to stand. I'm gonna to have to understand, I'm gonna to have to go through this quickly for you as to why sometimes the criminal justice system isn't the answer. The better answers out there are what you can do yourselves in trying to protect your own spouses, yourselves, your kids, your grandkids, your neighborhoods, your communities with your proactive efforts on some things I'll talk about here in a minute because when it comes to prosecution, as prosecutors, before we can file a case, we have standards, ethical standards we have to follow. Both the NDAA and the American Bar Association, the standards are the same. When you read the commentaries and the footnotes, here's the bottom line of what it is. We have to have a reasonable probability of conviction. In Utah, that means on a class A misdemeanor, which would be indecent public display, six out of six. On felonies, eight out of eight. Eight out of eight. Reasonable probability of conviction. What does that mean? That means as a prosecutor, I believe I have sufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a unanimous jury all the elements of the offense and the defendant's guilt. And then guess what? When it comes to these type of issues like everything else too, I have to believe that that's going to up, uh, you know, be upheld on appeal. I have to believe that the constitutional issues aren't so significant that the Utah Court of Appeals, the Utah Supreme Court, the 10th Circuit in Denver, or the United States Supreme Court are all going to uphold our work at the end of the day. I'm telling you folks, the frustration, frustrating thing to me is when you look at the laws here related to this, and child pornography I'm going to set aside for a second. So right now let's talk a little bit then about adult pornography related to adults. And let me tell you this, here's a simple way to remember it. Pornography is legal. Obscenity is not. There's nothing I can do to prosecute adult pornography, consensual adult pornography. We do in Utah have a good statute now related to, they sometimes call it revenge porn or pornography images that are sent out to, tr to try to basically harass, embarrass uh, another person that's not consensual. So that's an issue we can prosecute. We have a good statute on that here in the state of Utah, thanks to the work of Senator Weiler and others. Uh, we have that law in place. The problem though when it comes to differentiating between pornography and obscenity as prosecutors is, we, we're a little bit hamstrung. How the heck do you do it? Let me take you on a quick tour here of the, of the law of the United States that applies to Utah going back to 1973, Miller versus California. You're probably all aware of it, but I want to comment on it anyway because I can't do this justice without doing that for you. The Miller test. The United States Supreme Court said, how do you differentiate between obscenity, which is illegal, and pornography, which is protected free commercial speech and art? So the United States Supreme Court, Chief Justice Warren Burger wrote this. Here's how you differentiate. It's illegal and it's obscene if the trier of fact, which is a jury usually, it could be a judge, usually a jury, the trier of fact has to determine whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. Okay? So the prurient interest in sex. What does that mean? So the average person. 
I can't take all of you here in this room today as the community standard. You're the one extreme of the community standard. And believe me, I hear from the other extreme too. Whenever I start talking or sending out letters or give events in Davis County about my frustrations about this issue, I received a, a whole bunch on the other side, people who said you're crazy, you're an idiot, when we did a search warrant on Spencer's gifts back in 2007. So I'll talk to you about it. I heard from a lot of people on the other side of the spectrum in our community saying, you, you know what, you're, you're off base. You shouldn't be doing this as Davis County Attorney. It's wasting our time. You're wasting my taxpayer dollars to do a search warrant on Spencer's gifts. I hear from both. The U.S. Supreme Court has said we have to worry about what the average person is. So I guess the middle of that spectrum. And what more? The average person has to find that taken as a whole, it appeals to the prurient interest in sex. So to be illegal obscenity, it has to appeal to the prurient interest. What does that mean? You look at the legal definitions in Black's Law and other things, prurient interest in sex means it has to be morbid, degrading, and unhealthy. So to be illegal, the average person would have to find that particular work or that depiction to be morbid, to be unhealthy, to be degrading. That's what the prurient interest in sex means. So that's one thing we have to prove. If we're going to get it as obscenity, we have to prove it's morbid, degrading, and unhealthy. That it's not just normal, and the court has interpreted this, and they've defined this in, in subsequent cases. It's not just normal relate, interest that humans have in sexual relationship. It has to be morbid, unhealthy, or degrading, or it's legal. We lose on prong A if we can't prove it's one of those things to the average person in our community. B, rather the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by applicable state law. So it has to be patently offensive to be obscene to the average person. And then I'm going to talk to you about the state law issue here in just a second because they came back on us a few years later in a case called Smith and undermined our ability to have impactful meaning with our state statutes and I'll show you that in a second. So there you go, number C. Then rather the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And most of you probably all heard all three of these prongs before. But as a prosecutor, if I'm going to get somebody, Victoria's Secrets or Sports Illustrated, whoever it is, that's what I have to prove and show. This all of those things to the average person. So the difference between erotic art and protected commercial pornography is that which is legally obscene is not protected by the First Amendment, and that's the Miller test. Around the country then, besides the Miller test, there's no uniform standard. It's a community standard that's applied, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. So in effect, the First Amendment protections of free speech vary by location within the U.S. and over time. All true. So people tell me, Mr. Prosecutor, then in Davis County, our community standards are probably higher than they are in a lot of the rest of the country, and that's probably true as well. And the same is probably true in Utah County, too. We'll talk about the case that was tried in Utah County here in just a little bit. But then let me tell you what the Supreme Court of the United States did to us after Miller. After Miller, the Supreme Court came a couple years later, 1975, United States Supreme Court in, and I'm not sure how you pronounce this, I probably pronounce it wrong, Erznosnik versus City of Jacksonville. Erznosnik was the owner of a drive-by movie theater. The drive-by movie theater, I think it was Highway 191 from my recollection reading the case, doesn't matter the number, but in Jacksonville there's a highway that circles around this drive-by theater and people could see the movies from the highway. Well, the drive-by theater would play all kinds of movies, including movies that would show nudity and full nudity. Jacksonville had an ordinance prohibiting that as a public nuisance. Jacksonville city prosecutors prosecute Mr. Erzosnik. They get a conviction. Erzosnik appeals. And eventually it makes its way through the Florida court system, United States Circuit Court, to the United States Supreme Court. What did the United States Supreme Court hold? Two years after Miller, this public display of nudity on movies that anybody could see, including kids? United States Supreme Court, and this is still good law today, it has not been overturned. The US Supreme Court said they held that Jacksonville's ordinance was facially invalid as an infringement of First Amendment free rights. First Amendment trumped your ability to protect your kids driving by the highway in Jacksonville. Why? They say later on, I'll show you, I'll kind of skip down to it now, uh, where is it? You can shield your eyes. Um, yeah, there you go. Such censorship of the content of otherwise protected speech cannot be justified on the basis of the limited privacy interests of persons on the public street who, if offended by viewing the movies, can readily avert their eyes. They said it can't be justified also as the city's police power for the protection of children against viewing such films. 
Okay? Hope you can start to see the obstacles we're up against now if we try to take on these type of issues with a, with a criminal prosecution. They said it couldn't be justified by a traffic ordinance either, that its deterrent effect on legitimate expression in the form of movies is both real and substantial. So Jacksonville City's ordinance was too much of a deterrent on free speech. So the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Erzosnik's conviction and, uh, and overturned Jacksonville City's ordinance as too much of a problem. Then in Smith, becomes more problematic two years after that. So you have Miller 73 or Zosnick 75, Smith 77. Smith said this, in essence, in nutshell. The United States Supreme Court went further and stated local community standards cannot be dictated by state laws. What? If they're not dictated by state law, what are they dictated by? And that basically they go on to say juries, juries. So whatever a given jury says is the community standard, that's what it is. Now then guess what? It's more problematic than that. That might, you think it might be a good thing. Well, they go on to say that juries retain discretion in determining what appeals to prurient interest and what is patently offensive. State statutes only serve as evidence of the, more, of the mores of the community for the jury to consider. What does that mean? That means if I have a statute that defines indecent public display, and I can show that our Utah statute that somebody's public display that's, that's viewable by adults or children violates the face of our statute, that's not the end of the story. That doesn't mean a conviction. It means the jury's free to consider our state statute in the context of does it really reflect the morals of our community standards or does it not? The jury can disregard it because the U.S. Supreme Court has said they can and what does that do? It loops you back to the Miller test. Loops you back to the Miller test. More recently, the Supreme Court in the Brown versus Entertainment Merchants on a case involving violent video games, some of which were porno porn pornographic, struck down California's state law on that uh, and, and said it was too restrictive. Psychological studies purporting to show a connection between exposure to violent video games and harmful effects on children do not prove that such exposure causes minors to act aggressively. By analogy, then, that language, because some of these video games did have pornographic images, poses another problem for us then, trying to prove the causation of harm. The U.S. Supreme Court has said, you know, basically, yeah, you, it's tough. You can't really prove that that was what the cause of the harm was. Could it be the Saturday morning cartoons they watched? Could it be the commercial that they saw when they watched the sporting event? Could it be the direct TV advertisement they saw? You know, who knows? Could it be the magazine covers? So the U.S. Supreme Court said that you can't just say that these video games cause the problems. What does that do then? In Utah, that leaves us problems as prosecutors. If we're going to prosecute and try to convict somebody, we have to give a jury instruction. We have to outline for the jury what the law is. So stop and think about that. We then have to give the Miller standard, and then we have to say, but we have this Utah statute, but to give a proper jury instruction, the jury would be told, but that Utah statute is merely a presumptive guideline of what the community standard is. It's up to you hearing the facts that it's the case to determine, you the jury, what it really is in your community and just violate it posed a problem. Some of you may remember the Utah County case. I took this, uh, some statistics off of an article about this. If any of you remember the case in Utah County, it was now 16 years ago. The article I found was two years old. It said four, 14 years ago. Do you remember in Utah County when they tried to do exactly, try to prosecute some video stores? Because the video stores were selling and renting out X-rated movies. It went to trial. There was a couple trials actually in an appeal. At the end of the day, in Provo, Utah, the jury acquitted the defense. And part of the defense's argument was, okay, we've got these state statutes, but what really is the community standard? What's the average person doing in Utah County? And one of the things that the defense did, which is what they do around the country, is go through the statistics showing how much pornography was being consumed in Utah County. And the argument was, you know what? Why is my client being singled out, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when you look at what's going on in the homes in Utah County, the hotels in Utah County, the video rentals and purchases in Utah County, the community standard is being defined all around you every day by the community. And that community standard says, what my client's doing is good. Jury came back not guilty. In applying the Supreme Court law, the Miller standard, the defense's argument on the issue, okay? Uh, so again, answer by Utah County jurors, Peterman was acquitted. There's the article that's linked to it, and you can learn a little bit more about it. Recent efforts then in Utah to deal with the issue. So the few minutes I have left, now let me maybe turn to some good news, okay? So I hope, you know, now I've kind of given you the, the outline of the problems as to why in your, in your jurisdictions, your prosecutors aren't out every day prosecuting the Victoria's Secrets and the Sports Illustrated and the Spencer's Gifts, all right? 
they have to have ethically, they have to believe they have a reasonable probability of conviction that will be upheld on appeal. As a prosecutor, when you look at Miller or Zosnick and Smith, I can't tell you that I do. I probably am wasting your taxpayer money if I prosecute Victoria's Secrets in the Layton Hills Mall. As much as I want to, as much as I feel bad for those 14 and 16 year old girls sending me those emails, under the law, even if we got a Davis County jury to convict, I'm telling you the Utah Supreme Court and or the 10th Circuit would overturn the conviction at the end of the day based on the current state of the law. When it comes to minors, we still have the Miller test. When it comes to minors under Utah law, or harmful material to a minor statute, but there is a twist to the Miller test because whatever it's, it, what the Miller test says is, what does the prevailing standards in the adult community think with respect to what's suitable for minors? So even when we prosecute cases for dealing for uh, exhibiting material to minors, we still have to tie back into a little bit to the Miller test, but it's easier because it's easier to show that more adults on average would think that this is inappropriate. I got to tell you this, the Carmen Electra poll example. So here's the, what we did in 2007. Let me look at how much time I have left to get to the good news for you. In 2007, we in Davis County did a search warrant with Layton, Hill, with Layton City Police Department. Layton City Police Department was tired of getting a lot of complaints about the things that were being sold in the Layton Hills Mall at Spencer's Gifts. Uh, what was being sold in the mall, there, there was posters, but there was also things like genitalia-shaped candies, uh, you know, that were sold and, and those sort of issues. We felt like that maybe they were so bad that they crossed the line to give us probable cause to do a search warrant. For a search warrant, we only need probable cause. For a search warrant, you don't need a reasonable probability of conviction because the search warrant, you're trying to find evidence that could maybe lead you to reasonable probability of conviction. So for a search warrant, we need probable cause. We outlined it. We took it before one of our judges in Davis County who reviewed it, reviewed the law. We put up front the constitutional issues for the judge to consider in the search warrant. The judge actually ended up signing the search warrant anyway because the judge felt like when you're dealing with some of the issues in particular, like the genitalia-shaped uh, dildos and candies that were openly on display for, for minors to see. That was our argument. So the judge gave us the search warrant. Layton City Police went in and they took uh, over $10,000 worth of product out of Spencer's Gifts that day, uh, boxed it up, things that they felt like might violate the harmful material to a minor statute. By that night, I heard from Spencer's Gifts corporate counsel. You've got to remember, Spencer's Gifts at that time had 615 stores around the country. I don't know what they have now, I haven't looked recently, but 615. Leighton Hills Mall was just one of them. But by that night, I had heard from their corporate counsel who told me he was getting on a jet the next morning to be out in Utah in my office and it was critical that we meet. It rattled them. It rattled them, the search warrant did. They wanna know what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do about this. So that attorney came out and met with me. Uh, it, to make a long story short, over the course of the next few weeks as we're going through the evidence and looking at the case law, what ended up happening was Spencer's gifts. Now, I will just tell you right up front, I had a lot of people in the community mad at me both ways on this. This, I guess, was a no-win situation. A lot of my constituents were upset that we even bought off and went in and did the search warrant, but we truly wanted to know what we could find. There was more to the search warrant. We then did surveillance, and I'll tell you about that in a second, surveillance videos on Spencer's gifts that Leighton PD did for about two months. Um, at, at the end of the day, uh, we decided we worked out a resolution with Spencer's Gifts. So I, I had people mad at me both for doing it and then people mad that we didn't go to court and take this to a judge and a jury, that we worked out a resolution with Spencer's Gifts. I did a press release when we did it because people were very interested in this about what that resolution was with Spencer's Gifts. And some of the things in that, that Spencer's Gifts through their corporate counsel, and they were worried about this because under Utah law, like most states, when you go after a corporation, you can actually hold the corporation criminally responsible and seek damages, restitution, and penalty, but also all the CEOs, board of directors, anybody in the chain who had decision-making authority that led to the criminal violation can also be personally prosecuted. So they took it seriously. So Spencer's Gifts worked out, we worked out a stipulated resolution, okay, a, a negotiation. It's called a diversion agreement. In that diversion agreement, they agreed to certain things. They agreed that from henceforth moving forward, that Spencer's gifts would comply with Utah's dealing with harmful material to a minor statute, that they would segregate their materials. They would coordinate off anything that arguably could violate the definition of harmful material to a minor, that they would put that 
in, in a part of the store then that wasn't readily accessible to miners and that they would have an employee monitor that to make sure miners weren't going into it. They also, importantly to us, agreed to not employ miners in the store anymore. One of the big deals to us was they're employing 17-year-old kids to sell this material even to adults. They agreed they wouldn't do that anymore. They agreed to apply, comply with our indecent public display statute and they agreed to some other terms and conditions. Uh, they agreed to forfeit the items, so they walked away from their $10,000 in items. Um, and so at the end of the day then, we, uh, we then, the other big concession they made to us is they agreed to waive statute of limitations. So that if they ever violated this that we felt we could prove criminally, we could go back to that 2007 raid and use the evidence against Spencer's gifts to prosecute them at some subsequent day and time. They agreed then also that Leighton City PD could come in, and Leighton City PD, I get calls about every other month, every second or third month from Leighton PD. They go in and do compliance checks. And the frustrating thing is, can I honestly tell you that we believe Leighton, that Spencer's has been completely in compliance all the time since 2007? Probably not. Sometimes Leighton PD, Chief Keefe, you say, you know what, Troy, we found this, but we talked to them. The managers agreed that they'll, re they'll go back again and they'll put up, you know, stronger beads you know, beads that aren't as transparent, things like that. So it's been a give and take with Spencer's gifts since 2007. Some say that I wimped out by not actually prosecuting it, taking it to court and trying to get a conviction. Maybe, I don't know. We felt like that the resolution we got from Spencer's gifts given the state of the law was the best we could get because even though we had probable cause, we didn't feel there was a reasonable probability of conviction that would then be upheld on appeal given Erzosnik in particular, okay? So as an elected DA, you make the decisions you make, you're accountable to the public for it, and my constituency in Davis County, I heard from some happy about what we did and some not so happy about what we did, but that's what we did, and that's why we did it. So that is one enforcement action that did take place that we gave it, a, I, I hope, a pretty good shot. What else has been going on? Kudos to all of you who have been involved in city and county resolutions. I'm aware of a lot of them. We have been in our cities in Davis County. There's been a lot of people behind that. Thank you. Thank you. At some point in time, that may come into play in the future in a way that I'll tell you that might be beneficial. The other thing that I will, will give uh, great credit to, and it looks like I'm pretty much out of, out of time here. Great credit. Senator Todd Weiler's here today. You all need to know about a joint resolution that was passed in 2013 about the issues that Dr. Jennifer Brown worked on about the exposure of pornographic images to adolescent brain development. We actually have a resolution now passed by the state legislature recognizing this in the state of Utah. Uh, Senator Weiler also got a bill passed where it can be recognized in determining child custody if a parent has intentionally exposed a child to pornographic or harmful materials. A judge can take that into account. Um, we tried to run a bill a few years ago related to the science behind the, the brain and the impact on the brain. Believe it or not, it got shot down by the Utah Prosecution Council. I couldn't get the support of the rest of the prosecutors in the state to endorse or support the bill, so it went nowhere. I drafted some language. Senator Weiler was willing to run with it. He came up with a protected bill where we were trying to take into account this scientific literature about impact on the brain, and the Utah Prosecution Council, the statewide association of prosecutors, killed it. So the bill, the bill didn't, didn't go as well as we'd like to. This last year, Senator Weiler also had a protected bill, Truth in Advertising, that we had hoped would do some good, that we helped draft. Jennifer Brown helped draft that too. It didn't pass, but Senator Weiler gave it a hell of a try. Sorry, he gave it a heck of a try. Um, and I, and I, give, I give him kudos for that. He, he's at least willing to step to the plate and try to make a difference for you. Harm Next year, we're going to try to come back with a bill that enhances the penalties for all kinds of crimes, touching offenses, and I don't have time to go through it, but if somebody in, uses child pornography or pornography in the context of a sexual offense or domestic violence offense, we want to make it a more serious offense. We're going to give that a shot next year. It's planned. Uh, I then have for you a whole bunch of examples of the code sections in this presentation I'll give you. The last good thing I want to say, what is working in Utah very well and very aggressively, we're having a lot of successful prosecutions with the ICAC teams for the internet crimes against children, the child porn. The Attorney General's office, funded by the legislature, our office and other county attorneys, we are making a difference. In Davis County last year alone, we did 109 investigations into child sex offenses. Some of them are still pending. We've already got 30 convictions from those last year alone 
our folks who are dealing with child porn. Folks, I respect your time. I am out of time. Thank you for listening to me here today. I'll email you the presentation. But you make more of a difference than prosecutors do. So please continue to go out and do it.